We're going to go to verse 1 of chapter 4. Paul writing possibly the most famous letter that he's ever written to the church of Ephesus. And this is a power-packed epistle of six chapters. I preach from this quite often because it deals with every aspect of life. And when he gets to chapter 4, he's starting to really zero in on how the body of Christ should function together and edify each other. Uh, this church is a, a mission focused church that's really centered on serving uh, Baltimore with all the things that you're doing. And so this chapter is really important for you because it t t tells us how the, uh, w what kind of attitude we're supposed to have and how we receive grace to have the ability to minister in the way God has called us to minister. And so Paul says in chapter 4, I therefore a prisoner for the Lord, which means that he was either in jail or he was just using it metaphorically, meaning his life is not his own. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is his uh, boss, so he serves the Lord. So he calls himself a prisoner for the Lord. Uh, much of the preaching today has to do with being free. Very few people preach on being a prisoner of the Lord. Um, but when you're a prisoner of the Lord, you're truly free. Amen. You're free from yourself. Because you, our biggest enemy is ourself. We get ourselves into trouble, right? So he says, I, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And so today in the body of Christ, the emphasis is on uh, self-actualization, it's on utilizing our gifts, our purpose, our passion, do what we feel passionate about. But Paul's emphasis here has to do with, uh, he says in verse 2, walk in all humility. Walk in all humility. So in order for you to fulfill your calling, in order for me to fulfill my calling, we have to walk in humility. We have to walk in humility, in the character of Christ. Uh, there's not a whole lot of messages on humility nowadays. And then, we ought to walk in gentleness. We ought to walk with patience. So with all humility and gentleness, with patience. Bearing with one another in love. Which means that there is a struggle when we try to work together in community with anybody else. In this context, he's talking about a church. When you go to chapter 5, he's talking about a marriage. Uh, so there are struggles. There are things uh, that rub us the wrong way. There are conflicts, relational conflicts and dynamics and challenges. And so in order for us to walk worthy of the calling to which we've been called, he's telling us, he's not even mentioning our gifts here and our spiritual abilities. He's basically saying, in order for you as a church to walk in your calling, you have to walk with all humility. That doesn't mean some humility. That means that humility has to be the strongest trait that you have in your life. Some people uh, want to get ahead in the body of Christ just with their gifts and talent. And that will only take you so far. And young people who become successful have a very difficult time maintaining that success because oftentimes they get elevated by their gifts and abilities and talents and they think that that's how they ought to, you know, they made it that way and that's all they work on. Uh, but oftentimes they are internally shallow because you just think you can get by in your gifts, the body of Christ celebrates you, applauds you, put you up there on a pedestal, you have all these people coming and you don't work on your own inner fortitude, your own character. And so your life should never be built on your gifts and abilities. It should be built on character. It should be built on the character of Christ and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And so that's what Paul is emphasizing and focusing on here. And so for you to fulfill your calling, before you think about your gifts and abilities, 
We have to walk in humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And so, for a church to fulfill its calling, everybody has to be eager. That means you have to be motivated. Even before your own needs, you have to be motivated to maintain that unity of the Spirit, of the Spirit in the body of Christ. Because Satan only has one plan, not two. He has different ways of fulfilling it. But his plan is always division. Because if he could divide a kingdom, it cannot stand. If he could divide a church, it does not have the ability to maximize its purpose. And so that's why for you as a church to fulfill your calling, you have to maintain, you have to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit, which goes along with the other characteristics mentioned before that, is walking in humility. There's no way we will have unity in Rock City Church if people are not walking in humility, if they're not walking in gentleness and patience and bearing with one another. Bearing means that you're struggling. It doesn't, you know, you're not going to like everybody. you you got to love everybody, but you're not going to like everybody. And not only are you not going to like everybody, uh, you, you're going to have a hard time with people. There's going to be people that basically that you think are insensitive or uh, not courteous or who are not thinking of the good of the church, just thinking of themselves and and so Paul is not saying because you're in a church, everything's going to be easy. It's a real struggle to have unity. So bearing with one another, it's tolerance. Sometimes you're not celebrating, but you're tolerating. But he's saying uh, instead of having a blowout or leaving the church or having division, he's saying bear with one another. And how you do that is in love. Someone say in love. in love. And love is the perfect thing that bonds everything together. And then he's telling us why we ought to bear with one another, why we ought to walk in humility and gentleness and patience, why we ought to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit uh, for the church's calling to go forth. He said because in verse 4 there's only one body and one spirit. So... If you're in disunity with other members of the church, it would be like your finger saying, I don't want to be a part of this hand, and it would hurt the whole body. So if you have any neurological problem or you have like uh, Parkinson's or Lou Gehrig's disease or something where you don't have control of your muscles or nerves or something or you don't feel your nerves uh, or you're paralyzed or something, and part of your body is not functioning, it hurts the whole body, right? And so what he's saying here, I want you to strive to maintain that unity. Why? Because there's only one body. God doesn't have two bodies. God doesn't have three bodies. There's only one body. You are God's plan for the earth. It's his church. There's no other plan. There's no plan B or plan C. God's plan is the body of Christ. In this area, Rock City Church is God's plan. You can't go off on your own with your own vision thinking you're going to fulfill your purpose. The Bible is written to a corporate body, whether it's the Old Testament, it's to Israel, New Testament to the church. No such thing as individual destiny or individual calling. You cannot fulfill your calling by yourself. You need a local church. He's talking here, and what we do in America is we individualize everything. We do that in the West. So we read this all just for ourselves. Uh, you know, for my calling, I got to walk in humility. True. But you can't have a calling without the local church. This is not written to you personally. This is written to the church. So that means you can't fulfill your calling if you're not in a local church. You understand that? This is written to the church of Ephesus, not to you. The church of Ephesus had principles that are for all of us for all time. So there's a lot of people who think that they're going to fulfill their purpose just by reading the Bible, praying, and having visitations with angels. But it's not going to work outside of a body. The same way your finger 
as gifted as your finger might be playing the piano or something, your fingers, it still needs the rest of the body. So you might be the most talented person in the church, but you need the body to fulfill your destiny and your function. And so he says there's only one body. You're not it. You're part of it. There's only one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. And then he goes on to say there's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, is over all, through all, and in all. Now he's getting to how we fulfill this calling in terms of being equipped. This all had to do with having the unity, but now the next section has to do with how do we have the power to do it? How do we have the gifts? How do we have the grace? In verse 7 he says, But grace was given to every one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Right? So grace is God's gifts to us. Undeserved gifts. It's God's power, it's God's love, it's salvation. All this comes out of his grace. We're saved by grace. Everything comes out of grace, right? Ministry, spiritual gifts, uh, manifestations of the Spirit. All of this is part of God's grace and what, uh, or emanates from God's grace. So what he's saying is, for when it comes to your calling, all right, not necessarily salvation. The context here is calling. He's saying grace was given to each one of us. So how many want God's grace for their calling? Let me see your hands. You want God's grace. So then you've got to really pay attention to this next section. So he says grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. So now he's saying that the amount of grace, the kind of grace, or the grace that God wants to give you is given to you according to a measure. It's given proportionate to the measure of Christ's gift, right? So you need to find out, I need to find out what is Christ's gift because it is Christ's gift in this context that determines the amount of grace I have. It's Christ's gift that determines how far I could go in my calling. It's Christ's gift that determines how much grace, the proportion of grace I get. So we need to know what Christ's gift is. Many people think, well, that's salvation. That's the door that opens it up. But that's actually not what this is talking about. It's part of it. It comes from salvation, but Specifically, that's not it. So grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Well, I want to walk in grace. I want to know what Christ's gift is because it's based on the measure of Christ's gift, which means that there are different measures of Christ's gift. Uh, not all of Christ's gifts have the same authority, the same measure of grace. So what is Christ's gift? Verse 8, therefore, because of Christ's gift, when he ascended on high, when Jesus ascended into heaven, not when he rose from the dead, he rose from the dead, he walked on the earth for 40 days, but after 40 days he ascended into heaven, he led a host of captives, he took the people who were waiting in Sheol or hell, uh, the Hebrew word for hell was Sheol, those who are believers in the Old Testament, he led them in his train. He led them captive into heaven, into glory. And that's when he gave gifts to men, when he ascended into heaven. And so we need to know what these gifts are because it says in verse 7, as I remind you, that this is how we get grace for our calling. We give, we're given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. And then it says he gave Christ's gift when he ascended into heaven. In verse 9, in saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended to the lower regions of the earth? So all it's saying here is if he ascended, that means he had to come out of the grave. He ascended, he rose, he came from the earth, the depths of the earth, and so 
He came out of the lower regions of the earth and showed the power of his ascension. He had to rescue those people who believed in him in the Old Testament who was still in hell. He went, he took the keys from Satan. He has the keys now of hell and death, it says in Revelation. He broke out of hell, and he, when he ascended, he actually brought all the uh, saints of old out. That's why it says in Matthew 28, when he rose from the dead, there were saints of old that were walking around Jerusalem. Um, and they were probably hanging out for 40 days, walking around. I don't know what they were doing. The Bible doesn't tell us. Uh, maybe they would say, hey, man, I want some of that rice and beans. or I, don't know. I miss some of that food. I don't know what they were doing. But, uh, and so, he who ascended also descended. In verse 10, he who descended is the one who ascended far above all the heavens. And why did he ascend far above all the heavens? That means he went past the first heaven and the second heaven, and he went into the third heaven. And maybe there's an eighth heaven, I don't know. But we know that Paul said his body was caught up into, uh, I mean his spirit was caught up into the third heaven. Uh, and so he ascended above all the different levels of heaven, the skies and the firmament, that he might fill all things. It's quite amazing. Um, so he ascended, not just so that we could go to heaven. He forgave our sins and rose from the dead, not just so we can enjoy heaven forever, but he ascended so that he could fill all things, meaning that every realm of the universe would be under his lordship. So when it comes to the earth, when he rose from the dead, he broke the power of Satan. He did that so that uh, every realm, politics, economics, law, history, philosophy, science, education, music, media, arts, entertainment, sports. I think there's a sporting event tonight somehow. I don't know. Just <laughs> happen to remember there's something going on tonight. And... Um, he rose to fill all things. This is a thing. This is a thing. So it's not just prayer and healing. Things. He wants to fill all things. That's the purpose of the cross and the resurrection. It's not just so we can go to heaven. It's so that God's kingdom could come on earth. God's rule on earth as it is in heaven. Not just in the building, but in the police force, in the streets, in architecture, in plumbing, in sociology, in military, in every aspect. All things mean there's not one aspect, not one square inch of the ground that Christ doesn't cry out and say, mine. It is mine. He claims everything, not just some things. If he's not Lord of everything, he's not Lord at all. He's Lord of mathematics as much as he is the Lord over worship music. Right? So, he rose, he ascended so that he might fill all things. And then we get to verse 11. Now this is a very powerful verse because verse 11 explains what Christ's gift is in verse 7. Let's go to verse 7 again before we go to verse 11. Grace is given to each one of us according to the measure or the anointing or the proportion of faith or the fullness of Christ's gift. So how many... You want God's grace? Again, this is for your calling. The context from verse 3 and 4 is your calling. In verse 1, actually, it says, walk in the manner of your calling. So the whole context of this chapter is service and being equipped for that. And so verse 7 tells us that we receive grace for that calling according to the measure of Christ's gift. And verse 11 tells us what Christ's gift is. And he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds or pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry to fulfill verse 1, to walk in the manner of your calling. And so we find here that if you want to have uh, the power and the ability to walk in your calling, you don't, you don't get it directly from heaven. It doesn't just fall on your head like ripe cherries fall off a tree, right? 
You can't, it's not just from you fasting and praying and reading your Bible by yourself. All right? That's all part of it, obviously, to have a strong walk with God. But if you're not part of the body, you're not functioning in the body, and if you're not sitting under the fivefold ministry, you will not receive grace for your calling. Grace doesn't come directly from God to you. It comes through those standing in the ministry function of apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist. So if you don't think you need church, think again if you want to be in the ministry. If you don't think you need to be a part of the body, think again. Because to the extent that you're part of the body and sit under fivefold ministry, to that extent will God's grace come into you for your calling. And I've seen many gifted people had amazing anointings on their life, never amounted to anything for one simple reason. They can never commit themselves to a local church. They're always going on vacation. They're visiting one church every week. And they come and they, well, this is my home. Well, where have you been the last two months? Well, the Spirit of the Lord is just leading me here and leading me there. And they think that they're just going to accumulate information. Someone lay hands on them in a conference. Someone get them, uh, you know, a CD, an MP3, and running all over the place. Because they're never rooted in one local church, they never receive grace to fulfill their calling. And thank God you have an amazing anointed apostle as your bishop because your measure of grace is going to be according to what he has. In other words... You are limited by who's your leader. Because it says the grace comes according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So if you're sitting under somebody who's not even called to be a pastor, who's not really strong walk with God, it's going to limit your calling. If you're in a dead church, it's going to limit your calling. If you're in a scripted church that just wants to get a crowd and they preach 10-minute messages and you're in and out in an hour, it's gonna, you're going to have a crowd, but you're not going to be equipped. All these mega churches, very few disciples come out of them. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So it's, you know, uh, you will receive grace for your calling according to the measure of the gift. Now, not every person overseeing a church is an apostle. Some are prophets, some are pastors, some are teachers. And some are evangelists. Evangelists have the ability to gather a large crowd, but a lot of times uh, there's not that much discipleship. And so I go to certain countries. I won't mention their name. I don't want to offend anybody because there are, this does go on a you know, podcast, but uh, there are some countries, the smallest church I've been to is like 5,000. Uh, they're an amazing revival, but the, the people are a mile long and an inch deep. They just know healing and salvation and deliverance. They don't know anything else. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the average, you know, the medium-sized church is 5,000 in, in this country I'm thinking of. If you have a church of 1,000, it's small, very small. Um, churches have 100,000, 200, it's amazing. But there is no, there's no depth. And so what they really need are teachers to come. So you could be an evangelist and lead a church. You could be a pastor. You could be a teacher. You could be a prophet. Uh, you could be a, an apostle, obviously. So uh, your amount of grace will come according to the measure of that particular ministry gift. So if you stand in one of the fivefold ministry gifts, you have a measure of Christ on your life, and God has now given you as a gift to the body of Christ. Amen? Isn't that powerful? And it only says there are some who are apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers. This is not everybody in the church. Uh, maybe, I'm guessing from my observation, I'd say maybe 5% of the church is really called into this function. Um, and uh, so not everybody is called to that. However, everybody needs those ministry gifts to Blow up the earth with the glory of God, right? And if you're sitting under an apostle, then you will get apostolic anointing. Even if you're not called into full-time church ministry, you can have an apostolic function in government, in economics, in policing, or building a business. You could have a 
an anointing of the apostle come on you. And if you have a business, before you came into the church, you have one little, you know, storefront church, I mean storefront business. Next thing you know, after that anointing comes on you, you're building the franchise. You've got businesses popping up all over the place. So everybody could have a five-fold ministry anointing because you're getting grace from that ministry gift. But it doesn't mean you are a, what we would call an ecclesial apostle or an ecclesial prophet. In other words, you don't need the title. You don't need to call yourself an apostle if you're a businessman. That'll actually hurt you. There's other business people who think you're a nut job. If you're a governor, yeah, you're operating with an apostolic anointing, but you don't call yourself an apostle. You know what I mean? So you don't have to put church titles on people who are not in full-time ministry. That doesn't mean you're not walking in that anointing, but you don't need that title. But you still need, even if you have that anointing, you still need to sit under the, the church, the ministry gifts that equip you as your spiritual leaders. And, uh, and so to the extent that you sit under these folk, to that extent will you receive grace. And it's proportionate to the measure of their ministry gift. Not every apostle has the same measure. Not every teacher has the same measure. Not every evangelist has the same measure. Uh, and so and God puts you in the church according to your calling, according to your purpose, according to what he wants to do in a city. So he puts you in the right place. And so it says that these fivefold ministers, apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist, are called to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And so it's not Bishop Pierce's job to do the work of the ministry. It's his job to focus on equipping you to do the work of the ministry. So if Bishop Pierce had to visit everybody who was sick in the hospital this church would collapse. He'd have a nervous breakdown, right? The leaders in the church are called to equip the saints. If you're born again, you're a saint. How many saints do we have? You should be visiting the sick. You should be healing the sick. You should be feeding the poor. You should be filling up all things. If you're an archi architect, have Bible studies in your office. Disciple other architects. Bring them to the church to hear what the word of the Lord is. But by all means, disciple them. Whatever sphere of society you're in, you get equipped here to do the work of the ministry. And now the interesting thing is, there's an outward and an inward focus. Because it says that these fivefold ministers are called to equip or empower the saints for the work of the ministry. And what is the work of the ministry? Well, the context is verse 10, where it says that Jesus ascended to fill all things, meaning... The work of the ministry is not just in the building. The context is Jesus ascended to fill all things. Right after that, he says he equips us through the five ministers to do the work of the ministry. What is the work of service? That's what ministry means. What is this work of the ministry? To fill all things. You see that? And so you're called to outside the building, outside the local church, into the realm to fill all things into a, a particular realm and you are helping to bring the glory of God so there's no gaps in society. Every aspect of society has the stamp of God's glory on it, God's government, God's rule, God's presence. Amen? Amen. So you're called to bring God's realm, his anointing, his government, his character, his word, his truth into every realm. You get trained here for that work of the ministry because 95% of you will never be in full-time church ministry. He ascended to fill all things, not just buildings, right? I thank God all of you aren't called to be preachers because then it would limit the kingdom. He couldn't fill all things. If all of you were called to be pastors, it would be bad. You understand that? If everybody was called to be a church apostle, it would be bad, but everybody's called to fill all things with an apostolic anointing or a prophetic anointing. Everybody's called to bring God's word, God's truth, to make disciples, to win souls, and to bring God's glory. Isn't that good? You don't need the title apostle. You don't need the title bishop. 
but you are called as his representative and his minister into all things. Now, you can't be an expert in everything. You can't be called to everything. So all things is Jesus, he filled all things. He rose to fill all things. Only the church can fill all things unto him. You're only called to one part of that, right? So if you're in the military, you're called to bring God's sphere of influence in that segment of the military you're in. You can't even do it for the whole military. If you're a police officer, only that segment of the community that you're called to. And all of us together in Rock City Church can almost fill the whole city. Isn't that amazing how it works? So that's how our calling is dependent upon one another. You can't fill all things in a city if you don't do it with each other. Isn't that amazing how this all works? And so the apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers are called to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. That's you. They're not called to do the work of the ministry. They're called to equip you to do it. And what is the work of the ministry? To help fill all things. How many are following this? But it also says to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, right? In uh, verse 12, for building up the body of Christ. That is amazing. That means that the body of Christ is in all these realms. It's saying the ministry is to fill all things. That's the context. Then it also says to build up the body of Christ. That means there are people out there that are your brothers and sisters who have not been, have not been saved yet, not been discipled. If we don't fill all things, then we're not building up the body of Christ. We've got to stop thinking that building up the body of Christ is just what, what happens in a building. There are people God has his hand on in economics, in politics, in law, in business, in education, that if we don't get this vision, we are going to miss building up the body of Christ. Because building up the body of Christ means getting them saved, getting them discipled, bring them into the body, and the body keeps getting built up, built up, grows, edifies, grows, edifies, equipped. Isn't that amazing? And so we can't build up the body of Christ just by thinking it's going to be done in a building. Part of building up the body of Christ is by going into every arena of society. This is really powerful stuff here. And when is this going to end? It says, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. Whew, that's amazing. That hasn't happened yet. But this is the goal, that we all have the unity of the faith, that we grow to mature manhood, that we stand up like real sons of God to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, which means every ministry gift in verse 7 has a particular measure of Christ's gift. But all the ministry gifts together, working together all over the earth, equipping the saints, somehow or another in the future, it's going to be that they all together measure up to the stature of the fullness of Christ. They, they, they come to a place where they manifest fully Jesus Christ, his measure of faith, his measure of grace, his anointing, his purpose, his gifting. Somehow the fullness of Christ is manifest on the earth. And when that takes place, that's when it's over. That's when the last trumpet comes. That's when we're discipling nations. That's when every realm of society is under the Lordship of Christ. That's when we have whole nations that are discipled and are sheep nations. That's when we see the fullness of the glory of God. And so we're all working towards this Verse 14, so that we're no longer children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried by every wind of doctrine, and by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. And so, basically, uh, what he's saying is, if you are not 
committed to a local church, if you are not functioning in a body of Christ, if you are not sitting under a five-fold minister, right, if you are not working towards filling up all things and building up the body of Christ, if you're not sitting under a five-fold minister in a church trying to reach your city, then you're like children being tossed to and fro by every wind and wave. In other words, it's like you're at sea in a boat, and instead of going in the right destination, you're just tossed to and fro in the waves, and you're wasting your time. There are many, 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 many saints who are wasting their time. Many, many people are like children, and they don't even know it. They think they're very mature because they could prophesy, they could heal, or they have a lot of Bible knowledge. If you are not walking in humility, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit, and working under fivefold ministry to fill up all things in your city, then you're still immature. You're like a child. God doesn't just look at your gifts and your talent and your abilities. He looks at how are you functioning in the church. And if you're not functioning in the church, he looks at you as a child because you're missing the mark. Like a child is scattered, they're not focused, they don't know what they want to do when they grow up, they just want to have fun, they just want to do what looks good, what feels good right in front of them, they don't have discipline, they don't stick it out when it's hard, they yell and scream, they defend themselves all the time. They lose their temper when they don't have their way. They just don't want to work for the good of the family or the team, right? People who are just independent, just want their own way. God says, you're children. You're wasting your time. You're like you're in a boat. You're tossed by every wind and every wave. And there's a lot of doctrines that are out there. Fivefold ministry protects you keeps you focused. In some churches I know, every time there's a new doctrine, the people are, are, are floating with that doctrine. Right? I remember one pastor, he was telling me when uh, the movement of laughter broke out like 20 years ago, and he was bragging to me. He said to me, I haven't preached in four months. I said, why not? He said, because we've just been laughing every Sunday. Spirit's been moving. I said, brother, let me tell you something. If you don't stop preaching, you won't have a church soon. I said, you're going to have a split or you're going to lose everybody. I said, that's not God. I said, I can understand one or two weeks, but four months? And sure enough, that church within six months, maybe a year, broke up. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, and uh, there are false doctrines. Every wind is new fads. Now is hyper grace. You can live any way you want, and you're saved, and, uh, you know, you have just so many weird things out there. I don't even want to get into it. And so fivefold ministers keep you steering in the right direction. They have their hand on the rudder of the ship, and they're able to study more, hear more, compare notes more from other leaders. They have a better handle on Scripture, um, and they're able to steer the church. And that's why uh, Jesus said in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And who did he give that message to? It says to the angel of the church. The angel is, is the bishop or the apostle. It's the messenger of that church. He didn't come directly. He gave the letter to the leader of that church. And that leader is the one responsible to bringing the message so that people are not going in every which way. And so we need to be focused. We need to be committed to our local church. And then he says in verse 15, and we're wrapping it up, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way unto him who is the head unto Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when every part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So as the people in the church are receiving grace from the fivefold ministry gifts, they taught to speak the truth in love, and they themselves, 
equip each other. So it gets to a place where the fivefold minister starts the equipping process, and then people in the church get equipped. And once they're equipped, they're equipping each other. And when that begins to happen, that's when amazing revival and the influence of the church spreads. So we want to see every one of you not only grow, but to become, and not only to be equipped, but to become equippers under the one that God is using, the bishop and the leaders, to bring his grace to release you into your calling. So how many are ready for that? Praise God. Well, let's all stand up. And if there's anybody here who would say, I want to go to another level of service. I want to go another level. I want to be open to receive more grace from the Lord. And I want to even make a stronger commitment to this local church, whether it's giving financially, whether it's giving your time, giving your gifts and all of the above. You want, you don't want to be like a child wasting your time in the sea, being tossed and fro, to to and fro in the with the waves and the wind. You don't want to waste it, you don't want to spin your wheels anymore. But you really want to be committed. And you want to be committed to this body. If that's you, just come up to the front. We want to make that fresh commitment. We want to make sure that we can pray for you and, and bless you. There's so many gifted people out there. So many gifted people. But your giftedness will only take you so far. You don't sit under a five-fold ministry and function in the local church. God considers you a child. You will never grow to maturity. God. Let's just put our hands up before God and worship you. Why don't we do a, a worship song and just soak in the presence of God and allow God to really speak to you now as to what he's calling you to do, how you could better serve. There are spiritual leaders here that you could talk to to make that fresh commitment. If you haven't been to First Principles yet, you need to start that First Principles class every Sunday. Come like a burning flame, have your way, have your way. Come like a rushing wind, come like the fire again, come like a burning flame. Have your way, have your way. Come like a rushy wind. Come like a 
up all over this auditorium. Father, we thank you that you have chosen us before the foundation of the world. You've given us a purpose in life. And you called us together to fulfill that purpose. And Father, we just cry out to you. Help us to walk in that humility. Open our eyes so we'd see how we're fighting your systems that you put in our life, how we fight the people that you've called us to work with. Oh God, show us how we will never fulfill that calling just by gifts and abilities. Oh God, work that humility in us, work that patience in us. Open our eyes that we would allow you to do this. And Father, we want above all to give you glory and to serve you. Father, we pray that every person here would be grafted into this body. We pray that there be no loose bricks that anybody could just pick up off the street, but they would all be cemented in, that it would be impossible for anyone just to pick them out because they'll be cemented together. They'll be part of the building, the edifice that you are building up in this church, in this city. So, Father, we pray that there would be an awakening, a body awakening, not just an individual awakening. Oh God, that you would shift people from the individualistic calling to the body calling, from trying to fulfill their calling and destiny by themselves to doing it through their uh, people, uh, through their fellow brothers and sisters. Uh, God, that you would bring a great revelation here of what the church is, what the body of Christ is, that nobody would be tossed to and fro. Father, that nobody would be wasting time, that nobody would waste the talent and the days and the time and the years and the life that you've given them uh, just trying to discover themselves without understanding they'll never discover themselves outside of functioning in a body. And so, Father, we pray for a mighty awakening of body ministry. We pray that the saints in this church would be equipped, and not only equipped, that they would become equippers, that they would equip one another, that they would do the work of the ministry, that they would fill all things, that they would become those architects, those plumbers, those sociologists, economic people, educational specialists, uh, mothers and fathers, athletes, people in media and, and, and sports, in every aspect of society, that they would be your ministers, that they would be your witnesses, and that they would begin to not only win souls, but make disciples and those spheres of influence. Oh God, we pray for a hundred equippers in this church, people who multiply after themselves, people who make disciples, people who reproduce after their own kind, that there would be a multiplication of multipliers, that there'd be a multiplication of multipliers, that there'd be at least 100 in this church that would equip others, that would bring others into the destiny that you call them. We pray that there would be complete alignment under the set man that you've put here, under the bishop, 
that there would be, oh God, uh, 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 no spirit of grumbling or complaining, but people would walk in humility, bearing, 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 bearing with one another in love, not in pride, not in anger, not in wrath and not in selfishness, but they would bear with one another with love as the overriding theme that you'd release this church to the greatest years it's ever seen in its history. Let the next 30 years be greater than the previous 30. Let the greatest leaders that this church has ever seen begin to arise. And let people that nobody else has even noticed start coming forth. And some who are not even called ultimately to be in this community or nation, whatever nation or whatever city they're called to, that they would receive everything you call them to have at this time while they're here. And they would bring your message of the kingdom every place that you have called them to live and to function. We thank you, God, for a great outpouring. Let's just, just pray for a minute simultaneously now. Let's just pray. Pray that there'll be a body awakening, awakening that the destiny of your life will never be fulfilled by yourself. Pray that you would understand and that the church would understand that the destiny of your life, the calling of your life, will never be fulfilled by yourself. That's an important prayer. Feel it in the spirit. It would only be fulfilled in your local church. It would only be fulfilled through your church. Your destiny will only come forth through the context of a community. That's so biblical. Old and New Testament. You can't get away from it. Pray that the culture of this church, a body ministry, would be greater than the culture that we see in the body of Christ right now. The culture of the American dream. The culture of independence. The culture of every man for himself. The culture of entertainment. The culture of, of using God uh, just for their own ends that the culture of this church would be so great that it would change the mindsets of the surrounding culture, even the surrounding church culture. That they would go from being great individually to making everyone else great around them. They take the greatest pleasure in serving others and making this church go to the next level. Just wait for a minute now in the presence of God before we end. Amen. How many people here are going to come forth and allow God to work in them? what he wants so that he could work through you, through others. Let me see your hands. Praise God. two things. If I could just ask everybody to, to bow their head, close their eyes, we want to pray. And you know, we got a call to the to the city. That's why we do what we do here at the church to outreach. There's block parties and feeding the hungry, giving houses away, reaching out to to the broken and lost. But in that call too, we're we're called to the marketplace. We're called to our neighborhoods. We're called to, to fill all things everywhere that we go. And the nations of the world, that's why God brings the nations here. So that you can be uh, equipped and, and go and fill all things where God sends you. Thank you for, for a body, Lord. Thank you for a body, Lord. I pray that you, you'd strengthen this body. Thank you for fresh commitments here today, Lord, to, to commit fully to the work that you want to do here in this place. There's, there may be some here that aren't part of the body, that have never made that decision to let Jesus be Lord of their life. 
you hear these things of a calling you hear these things of being part of the body and don't know what it means or maybe you've walked away from from that commitment with Christ I just want to give you opportunity now to to get it right with him to come back and, and, and or maybe for the first time to take your place in the body there's parts of the body that that don't function like they should because there's people that should be there that aren't so I just want you to examine your life right now and if you have never made that commitment to Jesus to be Lord of your life or if you've walked away from it I just want you to acknowledge that in yourself and then lift up your hand and say that's me I need to make that that fresh commitment to the body fresh commitment to Jesus so I can be part of the body if that's you lift up your hand say that's me I want to come to Jesus today I want to be saved I want to walk in the calling and the plan that he has for my life if there's anybody here amen I trust that it's true I trust that it's true that we're we're committed we're part of the body and I want you to now open your eyes and look at me last week Pastor Charles was here and uh, he put out a challenge to us this number there was one million twenty three thousand five hundred and fifty five dollars and Pastor Charles said he's going to give five hundred and fifty six that would take it down underneath that so it would be twenty two thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars and the Saints we he said how many of us can give and let's get that down under a million and we said yes we'll do it well we didn't do it all the way we did it some but when you make a commitment when you make a vow we need to fulfill that vow and some weren't here and didn't get to be a part of that so I'm going to ask you today to, to give, to let's, let's eliminate this $7,837. Let's get that down, get that number down under a million. Let's give because you can't say I'm committed with my heart and your wallet doesn't line up with it. Because where your treasure is, there's your heart also. So some that weren't here, I want to challenge you today to, to give and to be a part of that. And some that were, maybe you could do more. If you can, we'd love for you to be a part of that. Let's, let's, let's be people that, that deliver on what we say is going to happen. The church, Pastor Charles, this is even in this church, and he contributed, and we can, we can finish the job. Amen? We can finish it. Amen? We can do it. So let's, let's give today. And, and he, he declared a word of faith with this giving last week that, that when you give, that he declared a sevenfold return on what you've given. And... Uh, for me, that's already happened since last week. So I want to challenge you to, to get in on that, to get on that, on that faith, because when you step out in faith, God's not a man that he should lie. He delivers on that what he promises. So I would ask you right now to, to, to consider, to say, you know what, I want to be a part of that. I want to, I'm part of the body. You, you can't love without giving. You can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. We say we love God. We say we love our bishop and Pastor Corley, we love our church. We love what God does here. We love it, right? Can't love without giving. Let's sacrifice today so that the work of the kingdom can continue, that we can feed the hungry, clothe the naked, reach the lost in our cities, do house giveaways. And there's constantly, there's people that come up here for food every day. Every day, there's people in need in our city. And because we have a people, we have a body that we, we come together and we give, that can continue. So I would challenge you today. Let's do it. Let's eliminate this so next week we can come in and see, get rid of that, that seven digits. Let's make that six digits. If we had faith, we could say, let's eliminate it today. All right, let's raise a million dollars, right? <laughs> we can do this. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this body, this house. Lord, this, uh, you set into the body as, as you see fit. Lord, so thank you for those that you've put here. Lord, I thank you that you've put me here. I thank you for those that you've put here, Lord, in this house that function, Lord, in this body. I thank you today for a fresh commitment to, Lord, let it be evidenced by our giving, Lord, where our treasure is, there's our heart also. Lord, let it be evidenced by our commitments. Let, our, let it be evidenced by our service. Let it be evidenced, Lord, in everything that we do, Lord, that we're committed to the body. We're covenant people. Lord, we're covenant people. You've put us here, and here's where we'll be. And we'll be fruitful and multiply. Lord, we thank you. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give and eliminate this $7,837. The hands to the hands and I in your presence, oh God. When you come, so pour out your spirit with love to be near you, oh God. When you come, with our hands to the heavens.
Spirit, we love to be near.